Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Avery McRae and here are your top stories. The Ontario government has unveiled its latest plan to combat the spread of COVID-19, which includes tough new restrictions, closures, closures, sorry, further capacity limits, and the temporary return to online learning for students. The new measures come as the Premier warns the province could see hundreds of thousands of new cases of the virus every day. Colin DeMillo reports. A new year and new restrictions from Queen's Park as the Ford government faces a tough fight against the Omicron variant that is slowly threatening to upend hospital capacity. We face a tsunami of new cases in the days and weeks ahead. And as we do, virtually everyone in this province will know someone who has been exposed to this virus. Now we're bracing for impact. The government says it is expecting hundreds of thousands of new cases on a daily basis over the next few weeks, and at least 1% of all of those cases will end up in hospital. This rapid rise of Omicron cases, combined with staff absenteeism due to Omicron infection and exposure, could result in the province's hospital capacity becoming overwhelmed if further action isn't taken to curb transmission. Just days after reassuring parents that in-person learning would resume this week, the Ford government walked back that promise. Schools will now be shut down until at least January 17th, the government says. Students will be moved to online learning, while health care and frontline workers would be eligible for free emergency child care. I know this isn't the news anyone wants to hear, but with the new variant, the ground is shifting every single day. The level of absenteeism, we're seeing in other sectors tells us with absolute certainty that operating schools ensuring teachers are on the job and not homesick will be a challenge we cannot overcome in the short term. Next, wide swaths of the economy are returning to lockdown for 21 days starting Wednesday, January 5th. Restaurants and bars will be closed for indoor dining. Indoor sport and recreational facilities will be shut down. Indoor concert venues, theaters and cinemas will be closed. Indoor meeting and event spaces will be closed. Museums, zoos and water parks will also be shut down. As well, social gatherings will be limited indoors to a maximum of five people. Indoor religious gatherings, weddings, funerals will be restricted to 50%. Personal care services will be limited to 50%. Retail settings will be limited to 50%. And public libraries will also be operating at 50% capacity. So Ontarians uh, and all key decision makers should be monitoring the hospitalization rates. Uh, uh, that will ascend fairly rapidly over the coming weeks. We anticipate that it will reach its maximum uh, by the end of January and then start to descend, so we anticipate a very short, uh, quick and rapid uh, approach to this uh, epidemic. But some are now accusing the Premier of landing the province in another lockdown by not taking steps earlier. We heard from doctors in the science table, I think it was December the 16th, suggesting that some kind of so-called circuit breaker was required. We heard nothing substantial from Doug Ford and his team because they went into hiding. Reaction to Ford's announcement is mixed from education and business leaders here in Thunder Bay. While some measures aimed at curbing the spread of COVID are being praised, the timing of those measures leaves something to be desired. Adam Riley reports. I think right now there's just so many more questions than answers. That is the general consensus for many following Premier Doug Ford's announcement that students will move to remote learning and not be returning to schools until January 17th at the earliest. The announcement was met with some criticism from local elementary teachers, President Mike Judge, on class sizes and whether or not the two-week window will have an effect on case counts. Judge believes in-class learning is best for students and teachers, but he understands the motivation behind the province's decision. I can appreciate the, 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 the wanting more time to, to get booster shots, to get uh, vaccination in our 5 to 11-year-olds. Um, if two weeks can, can do something to blunt that curve, then and that's great. The move to suspend in-class learning will be a challenge for the parents of the students affected and the Lakehead Board itself. Director of Education Ian McRae says from a logistical perspective, the board is ready for the next two weeks. He notes they've gotten better at switching between the two learning platforms, but like Judge, he's worried about kids being forced to learn from home again. We hope by Thursday we'll be up and running. Uh, it is a challenge given the nature of our uh, demographic with uh, our student population and our staff who a lot of 
individuals are in areas that have poor internet service, so they'll be able to come into the uh, work sites to use uh, the school internets. But uh, we're getting a little better at it, but uh, virtual learning will never replace in-person learning. Another sector affected by the announcement is the business community. As of January 5th, restaurants can only offer takeout and outdoor dining as indoor dining is banned, movie theaters will be closed, and retailers, including shopping malls, will be reduced to 50% capacity, and food courts will also be closed. As well, barbershops, hair salons, and other personal care facilities will be reduced to 50% capacity. This is hard news for business. I mean, this is not the way we wanted to start the new year for sure. Local Chamber President Charlotte Robinson says on the brighter side, she's glad to see the return of various programs such as rent and wage subsidies and a new rebate programs geared towards property tax and energy. However, she does take issue with how little is known about them and their rollout. It's not open yet. And so we don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know how long the application process is going to be. And we don't exactly know who all will be eligible. Um, and so there's a lot of questions. And that's a real disappointment. Robinson notes a big issue for some businesses is they will need to spend money they might not have as a result of this latest round of restrictions in order to apply for those rebates. She also has concerns with the closure of schools and how it can impact parents in the labour force and the short supply of rapid test kits, which could lead to workplace outbreaks. Adam Riley, TBT News. Well, here locally, the Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting more than 300 new cases over the past three days. The actual number is likely much higher due to the PCR testing changes that went into effect on New Year's Eve. And unfortunately, another person has passed away from COVID-19. It's the 71st COVID-related death in the district and the fifth since early December. There are 306 new cases in the district dating back to Saturday. 298 previous cases have been resolved, putting the active case count up slightly to 387. 256 of the new cases are in the Thunder Bay area, 37 come from other district communities, and 13 are from First Nations. There are now six COVID patients in hospital, that's up two from Friday, but none of them are in the ICU. Over in the Northwestern Health Unit, there were 256 new infections over the past three days, and the active case count is up to 410. 104 of the new cases are in the Kenora area, 96 from Sioux Lookout, 23 are in Fort Francis, and 21 are from Dryden. There are also four more in the Red Lake and Emo area, and two more in Rainy River and Atacokan. Local school kids are also reacting to the sudden switch to online learning for the next two weeks. Virtual classes will be starting this Wednesday following the new extended winter break. Officials at Loch Lomond decided to change their plans and open the ski hill today and tomorrow after the province added a couple of days to the post-Christmas break. And kids of all ages were flocking to the slopes to go skiing and snowboarding. The news about online learning was confirmed by the Ford government just before lunchtime today. And we spoke to some of the high school and elementary students at the ski hill to get their opinions on schools remaining closed for the next couple of weeks. Well, I actually kind of like it because I don't like getting on the school bus and having to wait out in this cold weather. I don't really like online school, but I mean, I'll do it. What are your uh, opinions on school being online for the next week? I don't like it. I don't really like it. Um, rather be in school. I'm not very excited about that. No. No. I don't like it because then you have to sit in a screen all day, in front of a screen. I like in person because then I'm with all my friends. Some longtime local politicians are reflecting on the life and career of former MP and federal cabinet member Joe Camuzzi, who passed away on New Year's Eve at the age of 88. Ken Boshkov was the city's mayor and a then fellow MP during Camuzzi's 20 years in parliament. And Michael Gravel was Camuzzi's special assistant in the early 1990s before running for office himself. Today, they recalled fond memories of both the politician and the person. Camuzzi still holds the record as the longest serving MP in the history of the Lakehead, winning six straight elections in Thunder Bay Superior North between 1988 and 2006. Boshkov says Camuzzi's legacy includes his support for the hospital and medical school and helping create the National Marine Conservation Area on Lake Superior. Well, there's no doubt that Joe's confidence and his connectivity to both the community in both those fashions here and in Ottawa uh, certainly allowed him to achieve a lot of things and to, uh, to keep his constituency happy as well as uh, the people that he had to work with in, in Ottawa across all parties. 
those of us who love Joe a great deal are very saddened by his, uh, his loss. He was a remarkable man, and, and this is truly the end of an era. I mean, Joe was a very special kind of guy. Whatever he put his mind to, he achieved, whether it was uh, the legal profession, business, or his long tenure in politics, he was very successful. And, uh, and did it his, his own way. That's the one thing about Joe that I think stood out. Joe did things his way, much like the Frank Sinatra song. And uh, he was highly principled, stood by them. We didn't always agree on that, and not, a lot of people didn't always agree with him, but he felt very strongly about that. So I always uh, admired him for his strong principles. Well, it took just 67 minutes into 2022 for Thunder Bay to hear the cry of the city's first newborn baby of the year at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center. Meet Claire Roseanne Russell, who was born at 1.07 in the morning on Saturday to parents Christy Peterson and Dylan Russell. With a due date of January 3rd, Claire's arrival was only a few days earlier than expected, but she was eager to be named the New Year's baby. The youngster weighed eight pounds and two ounces and the regional took to Facebook to congratulate their family with their new bundle of joy and wish them well. And very congratulations to the family. We got lots of great sports coming up courtesy of Corey Nordstrom, including what is the latest in the NHL and the status of Austin Matthews. That and more coming up. Stay tuned. <laughs> 